Okay. Okay, good evening and good morning to all who have joined uh, this online and face-to-face -face international roundtable on art for cultural diplomacy. Thank you for standing by and apologies for having begun a bit late. My name is John Zverev. I'm the Rector's Delegate for Internationalization at the University of Andorra, one of the three co-organizers of uh, this event with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Government of Andorra and the Andorra National Commission for UNESCO. I have the honor today of moderating this roundtable. A warm welcome also to the Minister of uh, Education, and to the Minister, Minister of Culture and Sports, to local dignitaries, to the participants, and uh, uh, discussants whom we are extremely pleased to have with us today, and whom I will introduce to you in a very short while. Um, I would now like uh, to ask the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Maria Ubakfond, to come up to the stage and deliver the welcoming address. Madam Minister, thank you. Bona tarda a totes i a tots, distingides autoritats, senyores i senyors. Em plau donar-vos la benvinguda a la taula redona que avui organitzem conjuntament el Govern d'Andorra, la Universitat d'Andorra i la Comissió Nacional Andorrana per a la UNESCO, sota el títol Perspectives sobre les arts per a la diplomàcia cultural i en el marc de l'ARCAM Andorra 2021. Sense dubte, la cultura no només mou el món, sinó que és de bé un pont capaç d'unir les persones i deixar enrere diferències, així com d'ajudar el diàleg i a trobar punts de convergència entre diferents actors. Només cal veure quantes institucions han treballat conjuntament en la conferència d'avui. De fet, trobo que és l'exemple perfecte que demostra que establir sinergies per una causa comuna en aquest cas, les arts i la diplomàcia cultural, és la clau de l'èxit. El títol escollit per la taula redona, Perspectives sobre les arts per a la diplomàcia cultural, no podria ser més pertinent. El govern d'Andorra i especialment els ministeris d'Afers Exteriors i de Cultura han iniciat recentment la reflexió conjunta sobre el futur d'aquesta forma de diplomàcia. De fet, la seva articulació i millor organització és un dels objectius estratègics del Ministeri d'Afers Exteriors per a la legislatura 2019-2023. Perquè malgrat aquesta reflexió pendent, Andorra porta molts anys exportant i important cultura. I ho ha fet tant a nivell bilateral, gràcies a la nostra xarxa d'ambaixades, com en l'àmbit multilateral, on han jugat un paper clau organismes internacionals com la UNESCO. M'agradaria aprofitar l'ocasió per destacar que des del desembre del 2020 el Principat d'Andorra també forma part de RITCULT, que és la xarxa iberoamericana de la diplomàcia cultural. Senyores i senyors, aquesta taula redona té lloc en el marc de l'ARCAM Andorra 2021 una trobada d'artistes que va néixer el 2008 amb l'objectiu de facilitar mitjançant l'art l'intercanvi dels valors que la UNESCO fa universals. Crec que tant aquesta iniciativa com la taula redona demostren l'aposta la, ferma d'Andorra envers la cultura, la pau i el multilateralisme. Però hi ha una figura que juga un paper clau en la difusió de la cultura i aquesta és l'educació. Per aquest motiu, em congratulo que s'hagi treballat en una declaració que ha de permetre, entre altres, ampliar el concepte i la pràctica de la mobilitat internacional i els intercanvis entre institucions d'educació superior amb l'objectiu d'incloure de forma regular programes d'intercanvi en arts, així com la noció de la diplomàcia cultural. Voldria agrair, sincerament, 
a la Universitat d'Andorra, a la Comissió Nacional d'Andorra, a la UNESCO, i a la senyora Ed Basser, ambaixadora de bona voluntat de la UNESCO per a la diplomàcia cultural i padrina de l'Arcam Andorra des del 2012, així com a la resta dels organitzadors per la seva feina feta, així com als ponents, tant els que ens acompanyen avui de manera presencial com els que s'han connectat i es connectaran de manera telemàtica per la seva participació i a totes i a tots vosaltres per la vostra presència. Abans d'acabar, voldria recordar la cooperació que tenim amb Malta i la Comissió Nacional per a la UNESCO, que des del 2015 organitza un art camp orientat principalment cap a països del Mediterrani. Tenim avui present el seu secretari general, Filip Casar. Estic convençuda que aquesta taula redona ajudarà a desgranar com la multiplicitat de variants artístiques poden permetre als estats fomentar una millor entesa mútua mitjançant la diplomàcia cultural, una forma de diplomàcia que, al cap i a la fi, revela l'ànima de les nacions. Moltes gràcies per la vostra atenció. Thank you for your very motivating words, uh, Minister Ubach, and for being the driving force behind this event. I don't think that we can but applaud the commitment of the government of Andorra to include cultural diplomacy as one of the strategies for its international relations. Uh, now, one of the staunchest supporters of cultural diplomacy in the world is, of course, UNESCO. We are therefore extremely pleased to have received a video message from Director General Audrey Azoulay, uh, which we will now view together. Madame la Ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Principauté d'Andorre, Madame la Ministre de la Culture et des Sports de la Principauté, cher Ed Vasser, notre chère ambassadrice de bonne volonté à l'UNESCO, cher Federico Mayor, cher ami, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs les artistes, Ladies and Gentlemen, UNESCO is delighted to be involved in this uh, new opening for uh, the latest edition of the Art Camp Andorra. It sent a long-awaited message of hope after a very uh, difficult uh, moment the world has been through. Because by changing our lives, this crisis has reminded us just how much our societies need art and culture. You know this has been UNESCO's conviction since its creation. It is also one of the dimensions of cultural diplomacy the theme that brings us uh, together particularly today. And cultural diplomacy is not just for diplomats. Its true ambassadors are artists, musicians, poets, all those who speak the universal language of art. We need it more than ever to rise above the crisis. For culture is much more than just an economic sector. It responds to one of humanity's fundamental needs, a need that is deeply personal, but also one that defines our shared humanity. And this is why public policies must put support for art and artists much higher on their agendas. In these times, we need more than ever to underline the anthropological, social, but also the economic importance of culture. And you have done this at Art Camp for 13 years now. Since 2008, more than 600 uh, works of art have been produced by artists from over 80 countries before being exhibited at the UN in New York, the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, and the OSC in Vienna, and in UNESCO's headquarters in Paris, where I had the pleasure of opening an exhibition uh, two years ago. I would like to tell you how much we appreciate the efforts that you've all made to create through these constellations of artworks a shared world. I would also like to uh, acknowledge the government of Andorra, the Andorran National Commission for UNESCO, as well 
as our Goodwill Ambassador at Vasser for supporting this incredible opportunity for creation. And lastly, I would like to thank each and every one of you. Uh, we need your voices, we need uh, your interventions, and they are even more precious to us in these times of crisis. I wish you a very successful art camp. Again, we wish to express our deepest appreciation to Director General Azoulay for having found the time to tape uh, these words of support for us and uh, words that could not uh, provide a better framework for the round table. Um, I would now like to uh, call to the floor Mr. Jean-Michel Almengol Petit, uh, the Secretary General of uh, the Andorra National Commission for UNESCO and also uh, the organizer for the past 13 years of ADCAMP. Jean-Michel. Thank you, John, ladies and gentlemen, the authorities, um, artists, participants of the seventh edition of ADCAMP Andorra, all welcome. You just passed one day here in Andorra, but I, I, can, I can feel that you already appreciate the country, and I feel that this new experience for you will be very fruitful. I will present shortly Art Camp Andorra, but first of all, talk about UNESCO constitutions. We we'll proclaim that since wars began in the minds of men, it is in the mind of men that the defenses of peace must be built. When the founders of UNESCO wrote these profound words in November 1945, they were certainly mindful of the devastation of World War II. Since then, it has become clear that art of power cannot be, by itself be guarantor of peace, that the high dignitaries of the various world powers need to consider devising the strategy to improve relations between countries and often antagonistic powers. Gradually, the soft power or soft force of culture, cultural diplomacy, has proven to be a valuable tool at Camp Andorra, guided by this conviction, the Andorran National Commission for UNESCO, in close collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Principality of Andorra, created by first Art Camp in 2008, so 13 years ago, this purpose of this residency of painters from around the world was to participate in the construction of a more peaceful world by endeavoring to promote intercultural dialogue and, and the exchange of views and ideas. Also to encourage a greater understanding of other cultures and to create respectful links between communities traditionally in conflict situation. These meetings aim ultimately to encourage a positive vision of cultural diversity conceived as a source of wealth, dialogue, and peace. Since its creation, six art camp editions have already taken place, and the seventh, which, is, which was initially scheduled sorry, in July 2020, has started today in Andorra. More than 180 artists from 80 different countries already came in Andorra, leaving beyond more than 600 original works and as a testimony to the stay in Andorra and the commitment to the universal values of UNESCO. During this period of crisis in the cultural sector, the National Commission for UNESCO of Andorra and the Art Camp project have demonstrated the desire to be actively involved in the Resiliat, which will be presented just after my presentation, the Resilient Movement launched by UNESCO last year, the participation of the National Commission was with, through short videos, artists from all over the world and from the six previous editions, we are able to make their voices heard to consider the revival and the future of culture, which is now and more and more necessary than ever to help the global population to better endure restrictive measures improved to try to stop the pandemic. Art Camp Andorra benefits from the high patronage of UNESCO within the framework of the Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expression of 2005, 
At the same time, and in accordance with the National Strategic Plan of the Principality of Andorra for the implementation of the Agenda 2030, artists are also selected by taking into account the commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. Over the years, and I finish, and thanks to the enthusiasm of proactivity of the project sponsor, Madame Edvard Serre, Artist and Goodwill Ambassador for Cultural Diplomacy, the project has expanded well beyond the Pyrenees and is already enjoying great global success. The Mediterranean version in Malta, I would like to thank here my colleague, warmly, Philip Casa, who traveled to Andorra to be with us today, just arrived this afternoon. Thank you, Philip. Other countries and regions have already expressed their interest in organizing an art camp where and of the role of the beautiful project can play in bringing cultures together as a mechanism of cultural diplomacy. Thank you for your attention, and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Toussaint, Secretary of UNESCO, the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Your Excellencies, dear artists and participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to extend the, my gratitude to the Andorran National Commission for UNESCO and its uh, Secretary General, as well as Ms. Hedvasser, UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Cultural Diplomacy, for their kind invitation to this uh, round table on perspectives on heart for cultural diplomacy. I'm very pleased to attend this important event to reflect on the role of arts and intercultural dialogue as vectors for peace and cultural diplomacy. As you know, these important subjects have priorities at the heart of UNESCO's mandate. The Director General of UNESCO has recalled in her video message how much UNESCO really appreciates the Heart Count, uh, the Heart Count Initiative. Heart Count is indeed an excellent initiative that contributes on several levels to transmit UNESCO's universal values. Firstly, the artists in artistic residency contribute through their creativity to encourage dialogue among cultures with a view to ensuring wider and balanced cultural exchanges in the world in favor of intercultural respect and culture of peace. Secondly, by bringing together artists from all over the world, this initiative promotes international cooperation and mobility of artists and cultural professionals that facilitate sharing of ideas and the cross fertilization of talents. Thirdly, Hard Camp encourage creative and artistic work while promoting the diversity of cultural expressions. All these objectives are at the heart of UNESCO's two important standard setting instruments, namely the 1980 recommendation on the status of the artist and the 2005 convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions of which I have the honor of being the secretary. It is in this regard that our camp has joined the Resilia movement launched by UNESCO in April 2019 to raise the alarm on the artists, cultural professionals, and the creative sector in crisis while celebrating the resilience of heart in adversity. Our camp's involvement in Resilia has allowed us to raise awareness on the particular concerns of painters. Indeed, UNESCO launched Resiltia to ensure that the voices and needs of artists and cultural professionals are taken into account in the international community's response to the global crisis of COVID-19. The voices expressed through this movement occurred the objectives of the convention in particular, to create the conditions for cultures to flourish and to freely interact in a mutual beneficial manner. 
and also to promote respect for the diversity of cultural expressions and raise awareness on its value at the local, national, and international levels, and to give recognition to the distinctive nature of cultural activities, goods, and services, high vehicles of identity, values, and meaning. The movement has thus relayed a wide variety of voices on key issues of the convention and opened up relevant avenues for action in the context of its implementation. To date, over 270 resiliat debates have been held in 110 countries around the world. The resiliat movement has resulted in 100 concrete recommendations that have been presented to the governing bodies of the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. These recommendations cover issues such as funding, economic and social rights for artists and cultural professionals, intellectual property, fair remuneration of artists, and the challenges of the digital transformation and also artistic freedom. The success of Residia shown us how essential it is that the voices of artists and cultural professionals can be heard by policymakers and to raise awareness on their precarious working conditions. The complexity and magnitude of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the cultural and creative sectors requires concrete and concerted responses at several levels. This is why in the context of the year 2021 declared International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development by the United Nations General Assembly, UNESCO has prepared a roadmap to accompany and engage its member states on three main points. Firstly, to review policies concerning the status of the artist, fair remuneration for creative work online and offline, with particular attention to social and economic safety nets for these workers in order to improve the resilience of the cultural sector. Secondly, UNESCO calls on its member states to create an enabling environment for cultural and creative employment in order to, foot, to further stimulate the contribution of culture to growth and prosperity, including the context of recovery plans from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thirdly, UNESCO calls on its member states to adapt cultural policies to the challenges and opportunities of the digital transformations. Ladies and gentlemen, the fructiful partnership that has taken place between Harcamp and the Resiltiap movement is a perfect illustration of the role that artists and civil society could play in order for the heart to remain powerful and effective tools for intercultural dialogue, peace, and cultural diplomacy. We will be pleased to continue this work with Harcamp. Thank you for your kind and patience. Thank you, Mr. Toussaint. Uh, thank you for sharing with us the role that cultural diplomacy plays uh, within UNESCO's strategy to achieve its goals and mission. And uh, uh, we will hear more from you in a few minutes. Now, our camp is an element of cultural diplomacy which will be the focus of the remarks uh, by the international experts who will now share with us their experience in understanding of cultural diplomacy from the perspectives of governments, intergovernmental organizations, organizations, uh, private organiza organizations, nonprofit organizations, the academic world, and artists themselves. But before I begin, allow me a few uh, housekeeping uh, items so that uh, the conference can run smoothly. Now, for the online panelists and uh, audience, since the remarks by the minister uh, are in Catalan, and the closing session will be in Catalan, 
I suggest that uh, you turn on the uh, caption or trans uh, transcript uh, function button at the bottom of your screen. For the panelists, uh, please make sure that your mics are off when you're not engaged in a discussion or presentation. Uh, for the online audience, audience, as you know, we have a Q&A session after the presentations, and you may submit your question by using the chat uh, on the Zoom screen, and uh, please indicate who you would like to address, uh, to whom you would like to address a question. Uh, the audience in this Congress Center can do the same. They can address their questions uh, through Zoom, uh, the Zoom if they've downloaded it on the smartphones, or they can do so uh, with, uh, through WhatsApp uh, once they, um, they copy the, uh, the QR code that is on the panels in, in this hall. Um, finally, just to remind you, um, as we had mentioned, or as is mentioned also in the program, the session is being recorded and it will be soon available on the Andorra National Commission's uh, for UNESCO uh, YouTube channel. In due time, we will be receiving information on this. That said, uh, let's give center stage for our guests. I, I would like to call to stage the guests, uh, the panelists who are physically here today. Could you please come up and uh, take your seats here? Ambassador Bregolet, yes, thank you. Before we also begin, uh, let me say that our panelists uh, have a few more minutes than we had expected, originally expected, because a very last minute uh, uh, commitment has forced uh, two of our panelists, uh, Mr. Enrique Marquez and the president of the University of Manila, uh, to default. In other words, they cannot uh, share stage with us uh, this, this evening. Okay, our first panelist today will be Don Fried, uh, Mark, uh, can I s I'm not seeing you on the screen. Okay, there you are, welcome, Mark. Let me briefly introduce you. Uh, Mr. Don Fried's interest in cultural diplomacy manifested itself very early in his, in his life when he wrote his uh, thesis on uh, La Diplomatie du Jazz, Jazz Diplomacy at the Institut des Etudes Politiques. Uh, he pursued his passion for cultural diplomacy by founding in 2001 the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in New York and the year later he moved the headquarters to Berlin in Germany. And the ICD has grown since uh, to become one of the Europe's leading cultural exchange organizations with programs extending to every corner of the world. Uh, Mark Donfield, Don Donfried, sorry Mark, uh, is also author of numerous uh, academic works in the field of cultural diplomacy, amongst which are uh, dictionary cu uh, cultural diplomacy and a cultural diplomacy in the private sector. Mark, please turn on your mic. Thank you. Is uh, the sound okay? Can you hear me? Sound is fine. Excellent. So first of all, I would just like to express also my sincere gratitude to the organizers, of course, the government of Andorra, uh, and we congratulate you on this initiative, initiative for cultural diplomacy. University of Andorra is the host, uh, and UNESCO. Uh, most importantly, I want to point out Hedva Ser, that's thanks to her friendship and support also of the Institute that I, I learned about this event that I'm taking part. And a final thank you to actually one of the individuals who's really responsible for the founding of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, Pierre Buller. Uh, I hope he'll be joining us today. We haven't had contact for about 20 or 30 years, but you may remember when I was an intern in the French Embassy in the United States, uh, you were very excited about my proposal to you about cultural diplomacy, and thanks to your support and contacts from actually New York at the Sergius Culturel, that was the beginning, the infancy of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, so I'm very happy, hopefully, that Pierre will be joining us, uh, and thanks again. Now, uh, let's say 20, 25 years later, uh, we have actually the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy, as uh, was mentioned earlier, where we offer actually the only and the first graduate programs in the world in cultural diplomacy. MA, MBA, and PhD. 
But I wanted to share with you today just a few reflections uh, to get the ball rolling for this panel discussion. And then I'm hoping we have some good discussion and debate later on in the panel. I thought it was useful uh, since, uh, again, the director and founder of the Institute for Culture Diplomacy to offer a few reflections on how I see the definition of culture diplomacy. Uh, I usually break it down into three different time periods or three chapters, what I call classical culture diplomacy, contemporary culture diplomacy. And I want to share with you a few of my thoughts on where I think the future of culture diplomacy will be in terms of artist culture diplomacy and also beyond. Classical culture diplomacy is, I think we're all familiar with, I would refer to primarily the governmental rule. Institutions such as the Goethe Institute, Institut Francais, British Council, really where governments were trying to quote unquote, win the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. This is much of what we saw in the 20th century, also the Cold War. Uh, Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard University, as we know, classified this as smart or soft power as opposed to hard power. Later on, the evolutions that we saw with Barack Obama and also Secretary of State Clinton, this really a famous uh, smart power, uh, which in its all of its imperfections uh, was at least attempted to be applied around the world. The more contemporary culture diplomacy, I would summarize very simply with six words. Culture diplomacy today, how do we educate, enhance, and sustain relationships with the goal of building dialogue, understanding, and trust? And at the academy, we look at examples from the public sector, private sector, and civil society when it comes to culture diplomacy. And we examine solutions and applications for culture diplomacy in three different kinds of relationships. Uh, conflict zones, where the countries don't necessarily want to work together, peaceful relations, where they do, and post-conflict situations. Let's say Rwanda or South Africa, where it's not only an issue of building trust, but also in terms of fostering reconciliation. Uh, these forms of culture diplomacy, I think everyone in the, the room and the virtual room are familiar with. What I wanted to share with you is maybe a controversial thesis for the way in which I think culture diplomacy could be applied more in the future. And what I'd like to do today is to actually take culture diplomacy and turn it on its head. What I mean by that, in the past, cultural diplomacy was always about speaking. If I'm French, I want to tell you about French culture. If I'm American, I want to show you American movies. Uh, and it was always this tendency, really, to bring our cultures abroad. Uh, and this is really very much the mandate, for example, in particular with the French, uh, where the French government is very much involved in actually protecting French culture and also promoting cultural diplomacy. And the French traditionally is seen this as actually part of their mandate to really take taxpayers' euros and invest them to support culture and to protect culture, quotas on the radio, et cetera. The American approach traditionally was more of a hands-off approach. Uh, culture is for the private sector. If Hollywood wants to earn money and, and sell movies, let them. That's not the government's business. Uh, there's benefits to both systems. And I think, unfortunately, the Americans, since the end of the Cold War, have made a big mistake in really saying, mission accomplished, no more need for culture diplomacy. As we know, the America House institutions were shut down around the world. And in many ways, there was really a pulling back uh, from the initiatives of culture diplomacy on the official side from the United States. So what I want to come back to, this idea of turning culture diplomacy on its head, I'd like to refer to the former foreign minister of Mozambique, who once gave a speech at the ICD in Berlin, and he said the following. He said, God gave us two ears and one mouth. We need to do more listening. And he was talking about his role as foreign minister, and he was making the point, listening was much more important to his job than speaking. And that's the provocative thesis I want to throw out in the room today. As we look at art as culture diplomacy, what about doing the opposite? Instead of bringing our art abroad, instead of bringing our music abroad, instead of importing, putting more of an emphasis on the opposite. Instead of the American embassy in Afghanistan, bringing American music and American art to Afghanistan, what about doing the opposite, bringing Afghan art to the United States, bringing Afghan musicians to the United States, which actually has happened and does happen. Uh, but I think we need to see more of that. That's what I mean when I talk about a cultural diplomacy based more on listening than speaking. And I think, of course, it's harder to sell that. If I'm trying to get my government to support me in, in doing something, they're going to say, why should I spend money to bring other cultures here? Uh, but I think even though it's difficult to justify, if the goal is really to build trust between groups, between cultures, between religions. And then I think you need a strategy that also is going to forge trust and not just me showing off and saying, this is my culture, this is my artist, this is my, my music. And I think that would be one thought I'd love to get feedback on from the panelists as well. Uh, how might we see artist culture diplomacy in hopefully a post-COVID-19 world looking? Uh, how can we have strategies? How can we have programs that will enable more listening uh, and less than just the speaking? Uh, of course, academic exchange is the classical example where I think it's a win-win for everyone, but we need more examples like that. So let me stop there with my brief overview uh, of the kinds of cultural diplomacy that we've given some thought to at the Institute. And I'd love to hear from the wisdom of the other panels, uh, their perspectives on artist cultural diplomacy. And perhaps in the discussion at the end, we can also debate a little bit this idea of a cultural diplomacy based more on listening than speaking. So thank you again very, very much. I, I look forward to learning from the other panelists.
Mike? Okay. Thank you, Mark. I think that uh, you all understand now that it was most appropriate to begin with uh, Mark Donfried um, so that we could have a definition of culture diplomacy as proposed by a representative of the institution that offers training and extensive research in uh, uh, this field. Now we're pleased to go back to uh, uh, Monsieur Toussaint at uh, UNESCO, but before let me introduce him to you. We, we know because uh, that he's affiliated to UNESCO, but we haven't given much background on him. So uh, Monsieur Toussaint um, joined, uh, before joining UNESCO in 2018, held positions in the cinema and audiovisual sectors, and also worked as an expert for several international organizations, including the European Commission. Uh, and he was also a John professor uh, in the cultural department of the Singapore University in Alexandria. He has more than 20 years of professional experience in uh, policies and strategies for the development of cultural industries and in building cooperation networks with professionals, governmental and non-governmental institutions in the cultural sector. From 2010 to 2018, he worked as coordinator of cultural industries development policies at the International Francophone Organization. Since he first joined UNESCO, uh, Mr. Toussaint has been head of the programs and stakeholder outreach unit in the diversity of cultural expressions entity, an entity which he now uh, leads, combining this position with uh, that of secretary of the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions in the Cultural Sector of UNESCO. Uh, Mr. Toussaint, you can take over, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, I would like to start by recalling something that had been uh, uh, said by uh, Jean-Michel, recalling that the constitution of uh, UNESCO states on its preamble that since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women that the defenses of peace must be contracted. The Second World War revealed the inadequacy of hard power for the maintenance of peace, and founding fathers of UNESCO considered that the soft power of culture is necessary to achieve a culture of peace. Thus, cultural diplomacy aims to encourage and promote exchanges of practices, perceptions, and ideas between cultures by strengthening the link and peaceful dialogue between different communities. UNESCO's missions and priority are in line with this perspective. In concrete terms, UNESCO promotes international cooperation, cultural cooperation as a means of achieving mutual knowledge and understanding between peoples. Culture has the extraordinary power to question our world to awaken our curiosity, to open us up to those who are different and to build bridges between people who share the same experience of artistic creation. Why this extraordinary power of the heart? Because heart addresses our reason as well as our emotions. And emotions are an universal language in the field of hearts, visual hearts are ones who have the stronger universal language. However, in order to enable heart to play its full role in fostering intercultural dialogue and cultural diplomacy, we need several conditions to be made. In particular, we need more cultural cooperation agreements between countries to promote and strengthen cultural exchanges. There can be no intercultural dialogue without exchanges and if everyone stays in his own whole house. It is better to get up, to travel, to let ideas circulate freely. This is why for UNESCO, HARCOMP is an excellent initiative for this purpose. With these restrictions, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how the lack of measures to support mobility of artists and their works has had consequences in terms of access to diverse cultural contents. 
We must also tackle the unbalanced exchange of cultural goods and services between countries as it doesn't create an enabling environment to a better knowledge of peoples through the arts. Furthermore, in order to enable art to play its full role in fostering cultural diplomacy, we also need the status of artists to be protected to guarantee artists freedom of expression and also their economic and social rights. The promotion of gender equality is another challenge to ensure that women's voices are heard in the heart. In fact, women are underrepresented in the heart. What will be a cultural diplomacy based mainly on the hearts created by men and that ignores women who are more than half of humanity. On all these issues, UNESCO is committed to raise awareness and to implement capacity building programs for its member states and all stakeholders. For example, in 2020, we launched a publication entitled Freedom and Creativity, Defining Heart, Defending Diversity, to shed light on the challenges of artistic freedom. This year, in June, we launched a publication entitled Gender and Creativity, Progress on the Precipice, which shows, for example, that women are less advantaged in the visual art sector than men. In addition to awareness raising, we provide capacity building program, programs to enable member states to set up, for example, measures for cultural exchanges, cooperation agreements, and co-production treaties. In the interest of time, I will stop here, that uh, remain available for the exchanges and for the dialogue we are going to have after interventions. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Toussaint, for your additional contribution. Um, and now uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, a um, speaker who was able to join us physically here today, that's Ambassador Eugenie Bregolat. Ambassador Bregolat has been Ambassador of Spain for 31 years and served in this capacity in China, in Indonesia, in Canada, in Russia, and his last tour was precisely in Andorra. Also, Ambassador Bregolat was seconded as Ambassador to the uh, Universal Forum of Cultures in Barcelona, of Barcelona of 2004. Eugeni, would you please take the floor? I would like uh, ministers of the government of Andorra, ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to focus on one aspect of cultural diplomacy, namely the exchanges of people especially of young people, in connection with the main objective of diplomacy at large, which is to achieve peace and cooperation in the world. In the last few years, the world's great powers are adopting an increasingly confrontational attitude, which could lead to a new Cold War. Should it become hot, it could bring about the true end of history. In a nuclear war, there would be no winners, only losers. Therefore, rational men would never initiate a war among nuclear powers. But if history teaches a lesson, it is that men do not learn the lessons of history and that they are capable of the most irrational actions. United States President John F. Kennedy, having seen the abyss of nuclear war opening before his feet in the Cuban Missile Crisis, drew the right conclusions in a famous speech at American University five months before his assassination. He appealed to basic human values. We all breathe the same air, he said. 
We all cherish our children. We all inhabit the same small planet. And he asked for a world free for diversity, a world in which countries with different ideologies could peacefully coexist. Besides the danger of nuclear war, we confront other existential threats like climate change or pandemics. Humanity can only overcome these challenges with close cooperation. If the world powers achieve a modus vivendi, the 21st century will enjoy peace and economic well-being. Otherwise, the future will be a bleak one. Cultural diplomacy, through higher education and the arts, can play a decisive role in bringing men, countries, cultures, and civilizations closer together, pushing them towards cooperation and fair competition instead of confrontation. Special importance should be given to the promotion of context and all kinds of exchanges among the younger generations to whom belongs the world of tomorrow. The European Union has created with the Erasmus program one of the most successful experiences of cultural diplomacy in history. I suggest the creation of a worldwide program of exchanges among young people similar to the Erasmus, including university students, but not restricted to them. I think that it would be a great contribution of cultural diplomacy to a better world, to a peaceful and prosperous 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bregolet, for underlining uh, what I uh, would say is paraphrasing Richard Lee's uh, book, the title of his book, uh, for underlining the uh, force of culture over the culture of force to achieve uh, a peaceful, peaceful world for all of us. Um, now, the next panelist uh, I would like to invite to uh, take the mic is uh, Ambassador Pierre Buller. Um, is uh, Pierre connected? Uh, no, Pierre is not connected. For some reason, I think he must have had uh, technical problems. Uh, well, we'll try to get him in later and then we'll give him the floor. Uh, then let's move on to our uh, last panelists who will give, a, give us a national perspective on cultural diplomacy, and that is our um, guest, uh, Leonie Aquilina. Ms. Aquilina uh, is Director uh, for International Development, Economic Affairs, European Institutions, and Cultural Diplomacy of the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of the Republic of Malta, which uh, she joined uh, in uh, uh, 2005, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she had previously worked in the private sector in PR and in branding as PR and branding expert in for national and international companies and served uh, as Malta's contact, later contact point, manager and coordinator of EFTA states and EU funding programs during which she oversaw the implementation and completion of important structural projects, including the conservation of Maltese sites that are now inscribed in UNESCO's uh, list of World Heritage Sites. I should also add that uh, Ms. Aquilino has an academic background in the arts and is an artist herself, and she's held, she's held uh, numerous exhibitions. Uh, Leonie, if you'd like to take over, please. Good evening. Um, I'm I hope my connection is a good one because we have internet and access. Good evening to everyone. I would I would like to first and foremost thank the Honorary Secretary General for the, Andor and for the Andorra National Commission for UNESCO and the government and the University of Andorra for this opportunity. Two years ago, in fact, um, uh, Malta hosted Art Camp by creating a, a temporary artist village with an artist in residence program 
offering participating artists a time and space away from their usual environment. Art Camp Malta 2019 provided a time of reflection, research, presentation. We're having sound problems. Related Art Camp Malta 2019. Is the sound okay? Sound better now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's better now. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. Um, uh, the relationship between the artists and the community where the art camp was held two years ago was an important aspect of the success of this residency project. And I'm mentioning this, I'm going back in time in two years, because this is a lead on to what we are to where we are now. Um, coming from the island of Malta myself. Uh, in fact, at the time, artists also visited schools and were involved in a community art project in an area which is sensitive prone to social deprivation, which is the very essence of um, uh, the enjoyment of um, culture. I mean, this is where cultural uh, diplomacy could also very much focus its work on, on social deprivation. Uh, at the time, 19 artists from 17 different countries were having to know to participate in a 10-day program that included schools, exhibition halls, theatres, local councils, governmental offices, and other community centres. And in this way, there was involvement not just by the government, but even with civil society and education and um, education institutions. Um, local artists were engaged in a community of representatives accompanied foreign artists during their community sessions and to facilitate communication with local participants. Uh, this promotes standing between nations in the context of UNESCO's intention strategies for development and peace. The main objectives of Art Camp, in fact, were to bring together artists from different countries and cultures to discuss their main concerns on the future of world peace to fight racism, discrimination, and intolerance, and establish participatory mechanisms for effective citizenship. And then the, the sound is having problems. By the diversity of cultural expressions and cultural heritage. Okay, can you hear me? No, we can, can hear, hear you. Yes. Culture builds, okay. Culture builds bridges and propels unity among diversity. As part of our public diplomacy campaigns, culture is instrumental in solidifying an ongoing increase of our political networks. In its efforts to reach out further on cultural diplomacy, in fact, earlier this month, right on the 2nd of July, Malta launched its UNIC cluster, more formally known as the European Union National Institute for Culture. UNIC enhances the creation of common EU cultural diplomacy, allowing for development and skill sharing of cultural diplomatic practices as a network for cultural relations. Such multilateral initiatives strengthen cooperation between countries in the promotion and strengthening of cultural diversity. International hello. Yes. And cooperation. This of work on three times and the manner in which perceive it. Culture expression is significant when it comes to understanding diversity to have difference. Act on faith, prevention, feasible innovation, understand the cultures of other people. This is the only way that we can connect in terms of um, networking and understanding each other through our diversity. But last but not least, we should also ensure freedom of expression through artistic expression. It is the very essence of this right to freedom that the world can bring nations together. And this is art. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonie. And uh, uh, apologies if, if the problem was from our end for the sound coming in, which was interrupted on and off. And I see that uh, we now have uh, Pierre Buller connected. Uh, 
seem to have. Yes, we indeed. See... Hello. Hello. Allow me, allow me, Pierre, to introduce you brief, well, briefly, as briefly as I can. Uh, Ambassador Buller uh, graduated from the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, you know, the prestigious ENA in Paris, and then joined the diplomatic service, service and served in Warsaw, Moscow, Paris, Washington, and New York. In the latter two posts, he headed the Department of Culture and Education. After a brief pause to teach uh, in Science Po Paris, he returned to the diplomatic service to serve as ambassador to Singapore and then to Poland. In 2017, he was appoint, appointed executive president of the Institut Francais, a position that he held till last uh, August. And he has now returned to teaching at the Paris School of International Affairs at Science Po, or Sciences Po. Uh, Pierre Buller has also written extensively on diplomacy in his publication, Power in the 21st Century, that was published in 2011, was awarded the Anteos, uh, Anteios Prize for best book of the year in geopolitics. Uh, Ambassador Pierre, you may not, uh, Buller, you may not take over, please. Yes, uh, hello everybody and sorry for having missed the link. Uh, now, um, I think we, we can certainly all uh, agree here on the added value of uh, culture and the arts added value to the cohesion of a society and to its ability to live in peace and harmony. Uh, and what holds true uh, at the domestic scale is even more so true uh, at the global uh, level between societies, between societies have, that have much less in common. And this, is, um, this has been explicitly stated by the EU Commission when it recognized in 2007 the value, and I quote, intercultural dialogue as one of the main instruments of peace and conflict prevention, uh, unquote. Uh, and that choice has been made by France when it set up a century ago uh, in the wake of an extremely uh, destructive world war, when it, is, uh, it set up the first building blocks of what would later be called the uh, cultural, cultural diplomacy. But that notion of cultural diplomacy became a catchword only toward the end of the Cold War. That, um, that's long after its practice has taken, had taken root uh, already throughout the world. And uh, with the, the most extended cultural network globally, and uh, France, I should say, boasts about uh, 1,000 uh, Alliance Française and Institut Français altogether. France has been a pioneer of that practice and uh, 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 many countries uh, actually have followed suit. The United Kingdom in the 1930s with the British Council, Germany in the 1950s with the uh, Goethe Institute, Spain with the Cervantes Institute and uh, Portugal with the Camões Institute at, at the end of the Cold War. Regarding China, the Confucius Institutes appeared only after 2004. Uh, that looks quite simple. Uh, and if it's about sharing culture, it's, it's hard to discern any rough angles. And uh, indeed, that was my belief when I started to work on uh, uh, what a, a European cultural diplomacy could look like. And there, I encountered uh, an interesting debate over the relationship between uh, cultural diplomacy and international cultural relations. Several scholars and respected ones had emphasized that international cultural relations go way beyond the actions of governments and their agencies, and that they are conducted by a myriad of actors, large and small, most of the time private uh, institutions. But what I uh, found out is that the, the cleavage line actually lies in the end goal. Should uh, it serve the national interest of the state conducting its cultural diplomacy in a sort of zero-sum game uh, among countries, or should it contribute uh, to a better understanding, mutual trust, providing a, a neutral platform for people-to-people -people contacts and exchanges, that uh, actually what is sometimes called intercultural dialogue. 
So, question open. Although I had not construed those uh, two notions as opposite, I could understand their contrast from my experience at the helm of Institut Francais. For while uh, some decades ago the model was rather top down, that means showcasing French culture in all fields, both uh, heritage and creation, uh, it has evolved progressively from that rather uh, costly paradigm towards a, a leaner and meaner one based on the uh, promotion of emerging artists on dialogue between cultures, partnerships and, and joint programs. And uh, I can see no, for my part at least, no significant contradiction between those approaches. Basically, those private actors are in most instances uh, not only very professional, but they often, uh, oftentimes seek partnership with state agencies to conduct their programs. Now, this having been said, uh, maybe a few words on how France conducts its cultural diplomacy. It dwells on the global network, I mentioned, those uh, 1,000 Alliance Francaise and Institut Francais, supported by the dip diplomatic network, which is the, the network of uh, embassies, and uh, a number of institutions uh, back here in France, ministries of uh, foreign affairs, on the one hand, Ministry of Culture, on the other hand, of course, but also agencies such as the Institut Francais and a, a cluster of cultural institutions like museums, art centers, theaters, all acting together uh, to feed the network uh, on the field uh, with content, with expertise, know-how, training, resources of uh, all sorts uh, and more, more those um, resources come more and more online in, uh, in a move that has been uh, uh, boosted uh, by the pandemic, as we can, of course, uh, uh, assume. It would be tedious to list the many actions undertaken by that system, but uh, so let me just put a, an emphasis on a quite important part of its mission, and that is the promotion of visual arts. The image of France is often associated with its visual artists and uh, uh, its world-renowned uh, uh, museums. The Institut Francais, for example, produces and runs the French pavilion at the Venice Biennale, devoted to uh, visual art every other year. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I think take this opportunity to, to pay a tribute to Christian Boltanski. Christian Boltanski was a visual artist who uh, died uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, <clears throat> he was uh, the uh, French artist, uh, the artist representing France in Venice in 2011. Uh, so it's time to, to pay tribute to him. In 2019, uh, Laure Couveau, uh, who was the, the artist selected and who won much acclaim. And in 2022, it will be uh, the uh, artist, Franco-Algerian artist, uh, Zineb Zedira. And, and she lives in the UK, by the way, so it's a very cosmopolitan. And she will represent, uh, probably represent France in Venice in 2022. The Institut Francais also runs several artists' residences abroad where many young visual artists uh, visual arts uh, artists can mature, so to say, and, and, and uh, create in an inspiring environment. And uh, it is uh, uh, City Francais and liable or in a position to accompany them uh, further, helping them uh, to gain access to main uh, art fairs. A, a quite different approach is that of the ventures undertaken by uh, our main museums when they export both their uh, museal know-how and their art collections in prestigious uh, venues. And you, you probably have heard uh, about the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, the Pompidou Center in Shanghai and Brussels, and it, it would soon open uh, uh, in uh, Jersey City, the United States. And uh, well, that's something that ended up being called Museum diplomacy in the, in the literature. And to conclude, uh, 
in the spirit of uh, exchange in dialogue, I, I briefly hinted at earlier, I should mention the role uh, France played up in, in setting up I played, sorry, in setting up uh, via the Institut Francais, the largest fair of photography in Africa, called the Bamako Biennale, which is now uh, being uh, progressively turned over to the Malian government, and uh, well, I hope it will uh, keep uh, thriving. I, I'll stop here, and I'll be glad to continue uh, during our upcoming exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bula, for this uh, very interesting perspective that it comes from the national government on one hand and from the leader of one of the ma major tools that the national government employs in uh, carrying out cultural diplomacy for to further its uh, agenda. Um, I will now, now that we've heard the three uh, perspectives from national governments, we can move on to the artists themselves. And uh, I would like to begin uh, with uh, our uh, colleague here, Pan, uh, Hedva Ser. Um, it's very difficult to do justice to the dedication to cultural diplomacy that uh, Hedva has shown us. The praises that we heard uh, in the welcoming, welcoming address by the Minister of Foreign Affairs and then uh, by the uh, UNESCO Director General were not gratuitous since uh, Hedva can rightly be defined as a passionate crusader uh, for the promotion of cultural di intercultural dialogue through her own art and generously collaborating with international public and private institutions worldwide. Hedva is an internationally recognized artist and her work includes sculptures, tapestries, watercolors and jewelry. Nonetheless, she's best known for her powerful sculptures and her monumental bronzes have become symbols of peace, of tolerance, of intercultural outreach around the world. Edva Sed is without a doubt one of Europe's uh, pioneers in using art to create social progress and education for peace. Over the years, her work has provided focus and physical connection to her efforts to build peace through art. And as part of her struggle for intercultural dialogue, Edva has been traveling the world since 2007 to unveil her sculpture, The Tree of Peace, on numerous world sites. I think the last one was in the city of Paris itself, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she also inaugurated her Garden of Hope with four monumental sculptures about destruction and rebirth in Krakow, Poland. Last but certainly not least, the French government honored uh, Edva said for her work with the prestigious uh, Légion d'honneur and the Officier des Arts et des Lettres. UNESCO similarly honored Edva, naming her a UNESCO Artist for Peace in 2011 and Goodwill Ambassador for Cultural Diplomacy in 2017. And finally, Edva is also a pillar of the Art Camp project and was instrumental in assisting us in organizing this roundtable. Edva, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. Dear Minister, let me call, Minister let me call, Minister 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 Minister. sorry, is it okay? It's not on, yes, yes, it's okay, it's on. Dear Minister of Foreign Affairs of Andorra, dear Minister of Culture and Sport, uh, dear ambassadors, friends from the Commission of UNESCO, and the Andorra, the Secretary General, and the Secretary General of Malta, well, I'm very happy to see you here. Uh, I'm very happy to see also on the screen Toussaint and Mark. It's a pleasure to see you both. And dear friends and artists, I'm very happy to be here with you all today for the opening of the first conference about cultural diplomacy during Art Camp Andorra, emphasizing how art can be an interesting element for cultural diplomacy. There are very few tools that I know of that are used in governing our world that are considered an art. Diplomacy is one of them. Today we are taking a different look at diplomacy and trying to de determine 
how art helps advance the goals of international relations. Over the past few years, the concept of culture diplomacy has taken root through the basic concept of using the arts to advance intercultural dialogue. is not something new. In fact, it has been at the heart of UNESCO's work from its earliest days. UNESCO's work within the United Nations system aims to build bridges between people and countries through exchanges of expression in culture, science and education. This exceptional UNESCO initiative intends to bring into reality the organization mandate to build peace throughout. With governments around the world finally coming to understand the benefit of bringing art and culture into diplomacy, it is now that we can see more focused and structured use of art in the context of international relations. Over the past few years, the idea of soft power through cultural diplomacy has helped define how the arts, education, sport, music, dance, and intercultural exchange, among other tools, can be useful in the furtherance of nation's foreign policy. This, of course, is a positive development, for as the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw told us, without art, the crudeness of reality would make the world unbearable. Culture is a set of values and practices that creates meaning for society. For me, the use of the art transmits values and messages in something that comes from the soul of each artist. Today, I would like to talk to you about few projects that I am working on, each of which I hope is designed to further our shared goals of building peace through art. First, of course, there is Art Camp, which I'm very honored to be the godmother since 2012. The concept of Art Camp is simple one, and it's a true example of culture diplomacy. It brings together artists from different nations and cultures, especially those who come for countries in conflict, to work on art project in order to create personal connection and build opportunities for the exchange of ideas and building bridges for peace. If the work of building peace has to be taken one by one, we have at least started in building peace through art. I like to remember the words of the American writer, Albert Hubbard, who said, that art is not a thing, it is a way. I hope that through our efforts with Art Camp, we have found a way to ensure that art will always be used as a compass leading us forward to build peace around the world. As an artist, the language I use is bronze. My philosophy is that art is a tool for peace. Working to build a better world, my art has always been an important motivation. And my sculpture, The Tree of Peace, is a symbol representing this goal. By touching these bronze sculptures, we can feel the weight of history and shape the future, where art plays a role in the virtuous path of peace and diplomacy. The sculpture is a symbol of shelter, a gathering place, providing welcome shade from the relentless heat of the conflict that seems to plug our world today. The tree of peace represents my vision of the single element in the natural world, which is rooted in the earth and generates life-sustaining fruit and oxygen. The Tree of Peace sculpture has been inaugurated at universities and other public places around the world, calling to our conscience in places where people can come together, providing an opportunity for men and women to reflect and talk about peace, making it part of our daily dialogue. For I believe it is only through personal contact that we can truly come to learn about and respect each other as individuals. 
Finally, since this year, I became associated to the international French-speaking artistic and cultural education program, Odyssey, which aims to make children in schools around the world aware of the richness of their local heritage by encouraging them to become active ambassadors. The Tree of Peace is one of the artistic educational resources in this program. The work is placed at the center of this process as a vector of universal dialogue launched in 2019. Odyssey now has more than 60 classes around 20 French-speaking countries. Each time it is greeted with enthusiasm by the students and the teachers. Some of my important activities are also being carried out in my work as a member of Policy Advisor Board of South-South Cooperation Council, SSCCC, whose chairman, Victor Spe Sebek, is one of our panelists. You'll see him later, I hope. We are gathered today to celebrate Art Camp in Andorra, which is a global initiative the government of Malta has helped in extension to Mediterranean countries, and I'm pleased to share with you the news that through strong SSCC networks in Asia, we shall be taking outcome to 10 Asian countries during the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG Festival Forum, and workshop in Manila. And we are also discussing with Africa, Middle East countries, as well as local government in Cartagena, where SSCC and Colombia Center of International Theater Institute are based with a view to, organization, to organizing art camp for Latin America uh, the and the Caribbean to emphasize more the history and the heritage of the African in, in those areas of the world. Art Camp is going all over the world now. We are going to issue one in China. We are going to do a Art Camp in Africa, in, um, uh, in uh, United Arab Emirates, also um, in Azerbaijan for the Caucasus countries. So it's taking really, it's, uh, it's going on and it's a program which is really, uh, which is very, very beloved by some other continents. In my art, if my art can help in any way to construct the shared values of tolerance, mutual understanding, respect, and dialogue that are the foundation of UNESCO's work, then I shall take some satisfaction that my efforts as an artist have allowed me to make a small contribution. I count of all of you to do likewise in helping build peace through art for our shared future. To conclude, I really believe that art can be a major element that we can all use to help cultural diplomacy in our world and to promote the exchanges and understanding between people. And I really thank the University of Andorra and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Culture of Andorra for all their help and kindness to make outcome becoming an important element into education and culture diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hedva, for showing us how individuals can carry out their form of uh, cultural diplomacy and align their efforts with those of uh, governments, intergovernmental organizations uh, for Hi. the pursuit of cultural understanding and intercultural dialogue. Um, I would now like to uh, invite our next speaker, a second artist in the, in the panel, uh, maybe actually He's uh, the third since uh, uh, Leonie Aquilino is also an artist. Uh, Daniel uh, Bausch. Daniel, are you connected there? I'm yes. here. Thanks. Well, Thanks a lot. There you are, Daniel. Well, allow me to introduce you briefly. Uh, Daniel graduated from the Academia Teatro Dimitri. Uh, he worked as an actor. Uh, sorry, the Academia Teatro Dimitri is affiliated to the Scuola Professionale Universitaria della Svizzera Italiana. 
He worked as an actor in several uh, theaters throughout Europe and toured the world for five years uh, with the tour company Donund Kirschen uh, van der Theater. I don't know whether I pronounced it correctly or not, but... Uh, <laughs> it's perfect, John. There it Great. is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, in Berlin, he worked with the Berlin Ensemble and the Deutsche Oper. He later acted at the Teatro Stabile in Brescia and has also, also staged numerous musical plays in collaboration with the University School of Music in Lugano. Daniel was head of uh, BA programs at the Academia and later for the programming of Teatro Dimitri, where since 2016, he is responsible for advanced studies and teaches improvisation in the first year bachelor's program. Since 2014, Daniel Bausch is also a member of the Executive Council of the International Theatre Institute and president of the Swiss International Theatre Institute. Um, Daniel, uh, the mic is yours, please. Okay, thanks a lot, John, for your introduction. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I just want to quickly explain you where I'm working. It's uh, Academia Dimitri. It's in Switzerland. It's a very small university for theatre. We have around 60 students and 50 professors, staff and collaborators. Uh, we have a bachelor program and three master programs and uh, we are working in Italian and English language. We have also research uh, department and advanced studies. And I want to focus now today on one program which we, in, which we started and we launched and we did it last year and this year, which is called Theater in Conflict Zones. Um, with this program, we invited students all over Europe and they started to, to work with us together in the first module, which we had to do online because of COVID. And in this module, uh, we were um, teaching, working around the themes um, uh, trauma, how to, how to work with trauma and how to transpose trauma into creative uh, theatrical energy. And uh, then we went with the students to North Iraq, uh, close to Erbil, and there's a refugee camp uh, which is called Mahmur. And we had uh, 10 also artists which are living in this camp and uh, they're doing dance and theater since many years, but they are stuck in this camp, they're living there. And uh, we did also the first module with them and then the group came together and we worked then with the kids of the camp. The camp is a very, very special place. Actually, these are Kurdish people. They were coming from, from, from Turkey 25 years ago, and then they were chased through the country, and then Saddam Hussein, he gave them a place uh, which is called Mahmur now, and it's, it's a piece of, of desert and uh, with scorpions and snakes, and maybe he thought that the people will die, but they survived, they found water, they created a small village, and the first thing which they did was um, that they said, okay, education for our kids is the most important thing, education and culture. And they built, uh, the first thing which they built was a school. And now there are more than 3,000 kids. Uh, they are learning in this school. And uh, they have also a small hospital. And they are living a kind of um, utopic life. I mean, they are stuck in this place. But at the same time, they are having um, a possibility where women have the same power as men and the families have a, a, families have a value. And they are living in this museum also something which is very beautiful. And it was great and very touching for us to go there and to listen to them. And there I want to connect to, to Mark and I found very beautiful what he said at the beginning about contemporary um, di cultural diplomacy. Uh, I think we really went to, to listen and uh, to learn from them, and we didn't go because we thought we, saw, we know something more than, than, than us. And this kind, of, this kind of relationship through listening and learning together created something which was very powerful. And uh, these teams now of the, of the Kurdish artists and our European participants, they work together with the kids, they created a show. And the show was shown also in the camp and all the families came. And as you can imagine, that was a very 
important and beautiful moment. I, I just wanted to share with you this, this story of a very specific project in cultural diplomacy, which I believe is also cultural diplomacy. Um, as, we, as we learned from Mark before, we can call this contemporary cultural diplomacy. Um, and yeah, it is really something with the idea that we go and something has to stay and something has to bring brought back to us. And this exchange, this kind of quality of listening for me is a, is a good quality, oh, no, no, let not say, say it's, it's a quality, it's something which for me is cultural diplomacy. One good example, I think. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. This is how uh, know-how transfer uh, can be used for cultural diplomacy. Uh, it's a wonderful initiative, and you should be applauded for that. Uh, we also know that uh, you have to leave today because uh, your students are premiering uh, theater work. So uh, I hope you can stay around for some time before, I think you have to leave at eight o'clock. Uh, yeah, I have to leave at eight, thanks a lot, yeah. No. Okay, and uh, if I forget to do it later, break a leg. Okay, thank <laughs> you again. Okay, um, now we get to hear from our third artist, uh, and, uh, or fourth art artist, if we include uh, Leonie again. Uh, and this is uh, Anthony Vella who is first participating in our camp and will take the floor in representation of all the artists in the event, if I'm not mistaken. Let me introduce you uh, briefly, uh, Anthony, if you don't mind. Um, Anthony's experience uh, with art began at the age of 14, uh, where he, was, uh, he won first prize with distinction in a national child art competition that was organized by uh, then Society of Arts, Manufacture and Commerce in, in Malta. He has a diploma in fine arts and distinction at the uh, Malta School of Art. And since graduating, he has taken part in numerous collective uh, art exhibitions all over Malta and has featured in uh, TV art shows, uh, radio interviews, and in local papers. In 2019, Anthony represented Malta in the UNESCO organized art camp on the island of Gozo. So, uh, Anthony, we're keen on uh, hearing from you what you take out of initiatives such as Art Camp, what they mean to you, and uh, what you might feel it means to your peers uh, with whom you spend time uh, in this uh, program. Thank you, John. I don't know if it is on or not. Uh, it's not uh, green, so it has to be turned on. Uh, Please talk. Okay, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't. Well, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you now, okay. Well, okay, your excellencies and uh, your honors. Um, ladies and gentlemen and fellow artists, good evening. My name is Anthony Vella, I'm better known as Tony, and I am extremely honored to have been chosen by the Maltese National Commission for UNESCO to represent the island of Malta as an artist in the seventh edition of Art Camp Andorra, and I'm also honored to represent you, the group of artists coming from different parts of the world. In 2019, I was one of the participants of Art Camp Malta, which was held between the 21st of October and the 5th of November. It was held in Gozo, Malta's sister island, where over 20 artists from the European Union, North Africa, and the Middle East took part. We were lodged in a village um, complex called Talfanal, in a small village of Asri, uh, which has a central private outdoor pool around which at times the artists used to gather to exchange their opinions on global affairs and express their views on current artistic and cultural topics. Every evening we were taken to the fishing and tourist village of Marsal Forn where we literally feasted on daily different four course Maltese traditional cuisine dinners complemented with of course local wine. So aptly organized by the members of the Maltese National Commission for UNESCO. 
during the 10 day duration of the art camp, we were taken on cultural and educational visits on both the islands of Malta and uh, Gozo to UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Worth, worth mentioning is the visit to the megalithic temples complex of Gantia in Shara Gozo, which is older than the pyramids of Egypt, where after a guided tour of the temples and museum, we all met in the museum's assembly hall and participated in a forum where all the artists expressed their personal views on world peace. At the end of the forum, each and every one of us was given a small olive branch, which we symbolically planted in a pot, and a small bottle of local olive oil as a token of the occasion. On another day, we, were, we took the ferry boat and paid a visit to the Maltese capital city of Valletta, where with Dr. Ray Bondin, who is an authority on the history of Valletta, our capital city, acting as our excellent guide, we had the opportunity to see Caravaggio's masterpiece, the beheading of St. John the Baptist in St. John's Co Cathedral, which is the conventual church of the Knights of Malta. There we visited our eyes on one of Europe's finest examples of high Baroque architecture. While in Valletta, we met the Minister of Foreign Affairs from where after a talk and some refreshments, we were taken to various places of historical and cultural interest, one of which was Musa, which is Heritage Malta's Museum of Art. One event also worth men mentioning was a visit to the Institute of Tourism Studies in Gozo, where all of us participating artists cooked and prepared one of our country's traditional food dishes, which we later shared and consumed in an informal dinner between us all in the most enjoyable and amicable atmosphere. During the art camp, we were honored by the visit paid by Her Excellency Madame Hedvasir, UNESCO's uh, Goodwill Ambassador and Special Envoy for Cultural Diplomacy, and by His Excellency Monsignor Joseph Vella Gauci, who is the Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Malta to UNESCO, by His Excellency Dr. Ray Bondin, President Maltese National Commission for UNESCO, and by Dr. Justine Caruana, the then Minister for Gozo. For most of the time, we were also pleased with the presence of Mr. Jean-Michel Lamingol, Secretary General, Andorra National Commission for UNESCO, and Mr. King Sumra. The overall experience of the Art Camp Gozo was one of extreme goodwill, cooperation, and brotherhood amongst the different nationalities, irrespective of race, religion, and political beliefs, resulting from a mutual and exceptional interest in the promotion of world peace through art and culture. May I take this opportunity to thank the organizers of Art Camp Gozo, especially Mr. Philip Cassar, Secretary General at the Maltese Commission for UNESCO and his charming wife, Anne, Mr. Matthew Sultana, Officer at PDM UNESCO, Mr. Porcellini, Mr. Gottfried Schwireb, and all the other, the other helpers for their excellent day-to-day -day coordination and running of the Art Camp, which turned out to be a huge success and wish further success to Commission Nacional Andorrana for UNESCO in this year's event of Art Camp Andorra 2021. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Anthony, and thank you all of the uh, panelists for uh, your presentations. We will now move over to the question and answer sessions. Uh, but before we hear from the, the audience, if they've uh, sent in questions, uh, let me um, ask the panelists if you have comments or questions that you would like to address to one another before we open up the floor to everybody else. No, no questions? No comments? Please take the mic. Could you could use a mic, please? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very happy. Just I wanted to add something which is interesting. Last time in uh, in Malta, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs Abena, he organized a very important meeting with the journalists, with 
all the journalists uh, and with us, with artists. And the first time he said, it was really a Minister of Foreign Affairs, the first time considered how important is art for culture diplomacy, how it can move culture diplomacy. And he was really one of the first, I'm so happy that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Andorra, uh, she's doing the same, you know, he, he's not more Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now we have our Minister of Foreign Affairs of Andorra, that she's continuing and she's helping a lot in, in this mission that really to, to understand how art, all kind of art, is important to move and is important for diplomacy. So what we call a soft diplomacy. But it came from Malta two years ago. That's, that's what I wanted just to add. Uh, really, he was, he was fantastic, uh, Abela. Thank you. Thank you, Enver. Um, I, I would like to address a question to uh, Ambassador Regolat, Ambassador Bühler, and uh, Leonie Aquilino. Uh, could, you, could you let us know what uh, weight visual arts had in your country's uh, cultural diplomacy strategies? Um, Ambassador Bregolat, would you like to uh, respond to that first? You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you don't know, you don't know what uh, weight it had, uh, how we're ranked in terms of uh, the efforts. If I can, if I can, I would like to insist on the point I made before. Uh, my experience is mostly been uh, political. Uh, polit yes. Therefore, my approach has been uh, political, okay. and uh, I have been looking to uh, cultural diplomacy as an instrument which can help somehow in a very decisive way to bring a better world. And uh, I would like to uh, underline again what I have said before, that uh, exchanges among young people of all countries are, I believe, very important. I know that in the world there are a number of experiences. Uh, I have uh, mentioned the, the, the uh, European Erasmus uh, program. I know that in the world there are more experiences than that. But to my mind, it is really extremely important that young people of different cultures, different uh, civilizations, get to know each other, get to understand each other, uh, get the habit of not looking at other countries, other civilizations through their own glasses. Uh, they, they become empathic and they uh, can look at the world not only through their own eyes, but also uh, through the eyes of other peoples. I believe that this is very, very important to have a, a peaceful world. This, this would be my, my uh, main uh, message. Thank you, Ambassador Bergulat. Um, Pierre, uh, Ambassador Bühler, would you like to comment on yes, that? Especially certainly. considering that uh, you ran the uh, Institut Francais, which is uh, uh, extremely active in all sorts of activities, not just visual arts, in, in uh, uh, cultural diplomacy for your country. Yes, indeed. Thank you, John. Um, actually, visual arts uh, was maybe the, the first or one of the two first legs of French cultural diplomacy when you know, it started some, something like a, a century ago uh, through uh, exhibitions which could be uh, traveled uh, throughout what was then uh, well, the, the close world to, to France. And uh, it was well, visual arts and performing arts uh, indeed, but uh, visual arts uh, actually France is, is quite uh, well equipped, so to say, Given a, a huge collections uh, France has in the in its uh, museums, given as well the uh, well uh, painters and visual artists that uh, in the in between the two world wars and after uh, well sets a tone for 
uh, artistic uh, creations uh, throughout the world. So this was a, a strong way for uh, a, a very uh, fruitful way for France to project uh, its image uh, throughout the world. Today, I would say, uh, actually, it has taken a, uh, of course, exhibitions keep traveling, but uh, uh, they don't uh, need uh, Institut Francais uh, anymore. It happens uh, at the level of, of uh, great museums, Pompidou, I mentioned Pompidou, uh, Musée d'Orsay, uh, Louvre, of course, and many other museums just are, uh, have uh, such a, a, a network, strong network of partners throughout the world to uh, uh, showcase uh, their collection and to, to, of course, as well, to welcome uh, uh, paintings and, and uh, visual arts uh, to France. So uh, what Institut Francais has been uh, uh, eager, keen to, to do is to allow, to help young emerging artists to reach the world stage. And uh, well, this has been, it, uh, it's done through the uh, pavilion, uh, the French pavilion in, in Venice, but also even more so through artists' residences, which are like incubators of uh, uh, artists. And there, I think the majority of, of artists in residence, and we have a running a, a number of uh, residences throughout the world. And there's, uh, of course, the Villa Medicis in, in Rome, uh, Casa Velasquez in, uh, uh, in Madrid, and uh, what's called Villa Kujoyama in Kyoto, Japan. There's a Villa Saigon in, uh, in, in Ho Chi Minh City. There's uh, one uh, French artist residence uh, in, uh, in Senegal, Saint Louis, Senegal. So I think uh, this is the way we, we, uh, we work to uh, help young emerging artists to, to reach the world stage. But it's a, it's a very important uh, leg still. Uh, it has been so at the beginning. It's a very important leg uh, of our work today to uh, uh, conduct this intercultural dialogue we have been talking about a lot tonight. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ambassador Buller. Uh, Leonie Aquilina, would you like to add something to that since you run a cultural diplomacy office in the uh, foreign ministry? Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Um, in fact, I think we have not mentioned digitalization, which is very mm -hmm. important to market and promote culture and diplomacy efforts, what we're doing. As mentioned before, yes, cultural diplomacy is a soft skill that we use uh, for our political networking, bilateral most of the time, um, also with another country. Uh, we want to have our peoples connecting. Now we have uh, UNIC, which I mentioned before, which is a cluster that has been launched on the 2nd of July, and we plan to have other EU member states from UNIC joining and what are starting with the first project in, in autumn uh, by bringing all cultures through film together um, uh, and showcase such cultures to, to the citizens of Malta. Um, but even digitalization is important. Last year, during when the COVID pandemic hit, we were trying to see how we could further our cultural diplomacy, and it was really um, uh, we had to we had to be creative. In fact, we might possibly be looking into um, a cultural digital platform to start showcasing what, in our case, showcasing the identity of Motis culture and also the identity of other cultures together with Maltese cultures and find the similarities um, so that uh, it links and it brings understanding and appreciation of citizens from, from any country that is participating in such projects. Okay. I, I think that's, that's the way you have to also look into as cultural diplomacy and dot all the efforts that our artists are doing or performing artists through digitalization. In that way, we'll bring in cultural, diver cultural diplomacy, cultural diversity 
also across even similarities because it's always cultural diversity that is something that we have to be looking into but also links and similarities and that brings ties stronger ties with with uh, different countries and uh, that knowledge then is shared online and that's something that can stay it's durable it's there's um, sustainability to, to it and access to everyone. Yeah. That's very important. We have to consider also through sustainable development goals to reach artistic expressions and artistic uh, and culture, um, access to everyone in terms of education as well. I think this is a point that we have, we can think of maybe in, coming, in the upcoming discussions of Art Camp. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leonie. Uh, would anybody want to comment on something you heard? Yes? You take the mic, please. If I can add something. Sure. Uh, Ambassador Bulleon, uh, I'm very happy that, that you are here um, talking about the French Institute, which many years ago I had, I had many exhibitions at the first institute, my tapestry. I used to show my tapestry. And it's something which is more elite, you know? And I think that now, uh, as talking with, it's a, it's a very good work for cultural diplomacy, but I think what we do at UNESCO, uh, especially what we did during the COVID with Toussaint, with the Brazil art, the movement for Brazil art, it was something which was really amazing. This is something which is an example for cultural diplomacy. This was something which was unique during this um, period. And what I was very happy that you could include us to some, uh, we, uh, I'm talking about Art Camp, because we had all our artists for Art Camp that were participating also in this wonderful movement, Brazil Art. So this was something, an act really of cultural diplomacy. Uh, and as I'm coming back to two points that I was talking already about, but I think that Outcome, if we are analyzing the analyze of outcome, it's something which is very unusual. You are bringing artists for countries of conflict, and I saw it many years ago already. For instance, we had the Armenian and Azerbaijan, we had the Israeli, and we had um, um, the uh, Palestinian, and they were even in one room, the two boys working together, and they became friends afterwards. They were writing to each other. We were building really through art, culture, diplomacy. We were building bridges for peace, and this is something which is very unique. And to spreading art camp all over the world now, doing it now in Africa with all the countries in Africa, doing it uh, in China, the country around, which will do it in Manila also for the 10 countries which close to Philippines, and then United Arab Emirates, they asked me already to do it with all the Muslim country, and they asked me also to invite one, one, uh, one country which is, which is not Muslim, they wanted to have an Israeli. So I said, no, you should have all, also Andorra. We, ha we have the three religions. By the way, the Andorra uh, artists will be always participate in all the others, uh, all the others' mission all over the world for outcome. This is, and I think that it will be wonderful also every time when we're going to have the mission of outcome, the session of outcome, to build also, as today, the first time, a mini or a, a conference for cultural diplomacy to show how is important cultural diplomacy. And it's a soft diplomacy, and it's something which is not always in, uh, in centers talking, you know, you have a very brilliant people coming and talking about, uh, about uh, uh, about diplomacy and culture. Here we have one by one artists, they're all together and they're working together. And there's another project that I was, that I was talking, which I'm very now, uh, that I'm working with these young women. It's about, uh, it's about, uh, uh, all about heritage. It's 20, as I, as I told you already, it's about 52 schools all over the world. It's a um, connection between 
the, all these students in the, all over the world, and I saw myself, I was in Limoges, it was two weeks ago, I was with the students sitting together, and the students for the Limoges, they had a Zoom with the students of, um, uh, they were from um, Mosul, and from uh, Syria, and the students of um, Limoges saw them, what is the faience, the, what is the faience, the heritage of Limoges, which is the faience, and they learned about it. And all this like this is also in Africa countries, that dialogue, it's a dialogue between all the students. And this is something which is amazing also, you know, bringing, that you were talking before, bringing young students talking about their heritage, and the, the proximity of heritage next to them, and especially having a dialogue with some others. The others from Africa, they see how, how the students in Syria are working, they are, they are talking to each other. And this is also country diplomacy. This is very important. So all these are, as I said already, one by one uh, project of not a big uh, uh, conference, but only on, on the really, uh, on, on the, how you say it, on the soul. People are working together, artists working together in all kind, in all sorts of um, fields. So I hope we can continue all over and continue this program and to invent some others program for children, for artists, as Brazil Arts, and to continue, and to continue this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emma. Okay, uh, yes, um, Jean-Michel, we have questions from the audience, two questions. Okay. Yes, uh, first, um, my name is Sam Rosales, I'm an Australian um, citizen, but a resident in Andorra, and I've been involved in nine uh, art camps. The first comment I have is from the Pakistani artist, Alim Dad Khan. It says, as Picasso said, every child is born as an artist. So keep the artist alive in every child. It must be part in our culture for the future betterment and improvement of human life. And uh, that was a comment. I also have a question from Leonard Schiancilapore. I hope I said that correctly. Um, to the panel. <clears throat> I'm 24 and watching from Adelaide, South Australia. Since 2017, my Rotary Act Club has been running our state's largest youth-led multicultural festival in recognition of the UN Day of Peace. Intercultural dialogue was mentioned as a key way for fostering peace and conflict prevention and is, of course, paramount to international collaboration. In a general sense, what other ways does the panel believe that young people and service organisations such as Rotary International and Rotary Act can help lead the way in fostering peaceful relationships and collaborations between countries at the grassroots level and within culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And I would like to point out that, uh, oh sorry, he's also mentioned, I'm also connected with UNESCO in Adelaide and would be interested to bringing Art Camp to Australia. Um, I noticed that uh, Mark Donfrey has uh, indicated that he might like to reply to this question. Thank you very much. Now, I'd love to offer a few uh, words of response to that question and then also pose a question myself, if I may. First of all, uh, Leonard raises a very interesting example uh, of volunteering or service culture diplomacy. For me, that's an example of what I call indirect culture diplomacy, as opposed to what I, have, I refer to as direct culture diplomacy. What I mean by indirect culture diplomacy, sometimes it's difficult directly to bring people together for the purposes of peace. For example, Israel-Palestine, uh, very difficult. How do you bring Israelis and Palestinians to come together in Israel or in Palestine to have common activities. So the strategy that we suggest at the Institute for actually any conflict zone or anywhere where you have two groups where it's not so easy to bring them together, indirect cultural diplomacy. A famous example of this, of course, is Daniel Berenboim uh, with the East-West Divan Orchestra, bringing musicians uh, from Israel, the Arab countries, etc., playing together at the highest level of music around the world. Another great example of indirect culture diplomacy would be sports as culture diplomacy, looking at institutions like Rights to Play from the United Nations, bringing, again, those individuals who are in conflict to play together on the same soccer team can be very powerful. With sports and with soccer, it doesn't matter what passport you have. It doesn't matter what religion you have. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Let's come together and play together on the same team. And that's what I find so remarkable also about volunteering and service. We ran for many years uh, young leaders programs where we would bring young leaders together, for example, from Turkey and Germany and all sorts of other countries. 
usually individuals between the ages of 25 and 35 with three to five years professional experience. And whenever we would do these delegations, it was at the highest level. We'd meet with heads of state, foreign ministers, CEOs. But I would always require one day with the young leaders to do volunteering. And it was an amazing experience. For some of these young leaders, they had never volunteered before. Uh, I'm American in the background. For us, it's common. You know, everyone very, very often will volunteer through many times of their life. And it was a great experience for a number of reasons. First of all, when we're there renovating a homeless shelter in Montreal, Canada, for example, you see a very different kind of leadership when someone's holding a power tool or a hammer uh, doing something practical. Secondly, it allows also those young leaders to interact with very different segments of society. And then later that evening, have meals with individuals who would live at these homeless shelters. It was one of example. Very, very powerful. You get to know the other aspects of Germany, other aspects of uh, Canada or Turkey, whatever the country is. And it was also a very good way to make a, sort of an automatic humility amongst all of the leaders. It doesn't matter what's on your business card, how important you quote unquote are in your professional life. Let's do something together. And so therefore, I'm a big fan of volunteering and service. And I think there's many, many benefits of integrating that into existing cultural uh, programs, or as Leonard mentioned in the example, to encourage institutions that are dedicated to this, like Rotary, Rotaract, and there are many other examples. Um, now I'd like to pose a question, if I may. I'm referred out to reminded in many ways of my college days. Uh, first of all, Pierre Brulaire, I don't know if you remember me, but when I was an intern in the Serbian culture in New York, you were very, very enthusiastic and really the first person to believe in me and my passion for culture diplomacy. Uh, and you very, I mentioned this earlier, but you weren't on, and you gave me all kinds of contacts uh, to Terry de Montbrial in Paris and in New York. And that was really the beginnings of what later became the Institute. So in many ways, it means a lot to me to have you on the, the talk today. It's been about 20, 25 years. Uh, we've come a long way. So let's definitely get in touch later on. Uh, it's, it's to catch up and maybe even collaborate again. Uh, but while I was also an undergraduate at Columbia, I not only did an internship at the Service Culture of the French Embassy, uh, but I, I also started the Institute for Culture Diplomacy. One of my classmates at the time, her name is Lauren Hill. Uh, many may have heard of her. She was a famous singer. She was also with the group The Fugees. Uh, she actually dropped out of Columbia when her album The Score became very, very successful. But Lauren Hill started an organization at the same time as me. Hers was called The Refugee Project, dedicated to refugees around the world. Lauren's philosophy also very much influenced my philosophy on culture diplomacy. She would always say, Mark, the main difference between human beings in the world is not race or ethnicity or gender or any of these other categories that we usually use. The main difference between human beings in the world is access access to many things, access to peace, access to education, access to food, access to medicine, access. That was the filter that she used to look at the differences in the world. And for me, it was actually a very optimistic philosophy, because if you agree with her and you say, actually, that's the main difference between us. Some individuals in the world have access to what they want and what they need, some don't. Actually, it becomes easier because we have enough of everything. We have enough peace, we have enough education, we have enough resources. It's really just a matter of access. And therefore, I think culture diplomacy, as we look to the future, that's one of the main contributions culture diplomacy can make. Let's, let's uh, build the bridges. Let's make it easier for us to access each other's culture. As I said before, more listening, less speaking. And uh, the question I wanted to ask to Pierre Brulaire, I've also been very passionate about French culture diplomacy since its inception. You could say 1870, 1871, were the first uh, developments of Alliance Francaise, Institut Francais. And you see with France, also an interesting evolution, as you were referring to, from unilateral to uh, bilateral to multilateral culture diplomacy. Unilateral culture diplomacy during the Cold War was, for example, on the front of every America house. They had a little plaque that said, to tell America's story to the world. So really, in a unilateral way, let's tell our story. That's, I would argue, culture diplomacy of the past. Marcia. Then we have bilateral culture diplomacy, which is much of also the Cold War. This ping pong is back and forth between nations. What I find most exciting as an American living in Europe now almost 21 years is to see the wonderful successes of multilateral culture diplomacy, especially from the European Union. Uh, example Examples like Erasmus were referred to again, amazing. I think for me, that's the best form of culture diplomacy. Let's facilitate access for exchange and allow those students to then discover for themselves uh, everything about these countries. Mark, My question to you, uh, Mark, Mr. Brunner, I'm going to stop, yes. Mark, if I may, it's wonderful to see how passionate you are about the subject. Um, <laughs> and I would hate, I hate to cut you off, but if you could just wrap it up. And you know, I would like to Two have seconds. comments from uh, the other panelists on what you just uh, responded Two to seconds. the... To, to Mr. Brulé, the question is, do you see the future of French culture diplomacy inherently being multilateral? In the sense, will we see less Institut Francais? Will we see more unique, for example, that unique is not just a network, but maybe more than that? Do you see the destiny of French culture diplomacy within Europe in terms of a multilateral vision? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Shall I answer, John? Please or? do, please do, Pierre, yeah. yes. Yes, I'm, I'm really happy to see Mark again after a quarter century. Uh, I remember he was 
an, an equally passionate intern <laughs> at the French Cultural Services on Fifth Avenue in uh, New York, and I'm well, I'm happy to have contributed to your your call uh, and your appetite for cultural diplomacy. So I would like to commend that and uh, <laughs> to pay tribute to you. Uh, you did, uh, I think, uh, from time to time, I, I saw you on, on, on the internet, and, and uh, you, you, I think you have uh, you have done a, a, a great job. So uh, to to it uh, it would be a, a long answer, but. Uh, I'll make it short. I, I think I, I was, I'm a great fan of um, U, a, a European cultural diplomacy, and I, I really uh, tried even to uh, uh, develop it and to, to drop some proposals. But what, what I saw, uh, actually, this is what I mentioned in, in my uh, uh, initial remarks, is that there is sort of a... Uh, 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 but prevention uh, in the European galaxy, the, the Brussels cluster, vis-à-vis -vis cultural diplomacy, because a, a number of, of people think, well, this is uh, it's a matter for national uh, diplomacies, but if there, well, a nation is projecting itself, it's uh, showcasing itself uh, abroad, but uh, does the, the European Union is not a state, uh, and uh, what, what will it show? Because at the end of the day, uh, the bigger countries with, well, maybe more uh, cultural assets will uh, 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 skip uh, the, how would you say that? Skip, skip the, skip, uh, skip the mill, uh, and um, uh, and so it's very hard. You mentioned the unique uh, network, which is a network network of European uh, cultural institutes uh, throughout the world, but uh, it only lives if someone is just pulling uh, pulling it, uh, and quite often each. Uh, National cultural institute in foreign countries is uh, just remaining on other sides. Don't okay. want to to uh, mutualize to share that uh, European uh, uh, well, the, well cultural action. And, and just one one quick uh, remark uh, about a I when I was an ambassador to Singapore, I. Uh, uh, I thought it, it, it's so silly because everybody has cultural programs in the city, but it's never uh, there's no joint communication uh, about that. And so I, I told my colleagues, ambassadors Singapore, why why don't we do a European season in Singapore? And uh, they said, oh, of course, very good idea. But when it came to to Fund, funding it because well it, it needs uh, such an event such a, uh, a venue needs uh, funding uh, I told them listen maybe we have some we all have uh, uh, businesses uh, in Singapore we, we could ask them for do sort of a, a crowd business funding and uh, there was no, no one left so I had to do that uh, with my own force, uh, forces forces with our French uh, okay. businesses uh, on, on the one hand, and I had to, to do, to scramble to find uh, Singaporean uh, uh, foundations to help us fund that European season in Singapore. And it, well, it happened. It, uh, it was uh, quite successful. It lasted for six or eight months with a, a communication, joint communication campaign. Everybody, uh, it was only funded through the money I, I could find with the foundation and with the French businesses. But for the opening uh, gala dinner, everybody was uh, wanted to be on the on the photo. So I think uh, this is this was a bit symbolic of okay. the, the difficulty to lift the European uh, culture through while well, this uh, European. Uh, Machinery, which is yep. ours, uh, this is what. Uh, well, my my only regrets was it, it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't fly uh, just alone. Thank Sorry, you. I, I've been a bit long. 
Thank you, Ambassador Bula. Um, uh, Monsieur Toussaint, um, just picking up on a point that uh, comment that uh, Ambassador Bula just made, how difficult is it for UNESCO uh, to align member states uh, with uh, its uh, cultural diplomacy programs? Thank you, John. Uh, it was very inspiring to hear from uh, all perspectives at the national levels. But uh, uh, from our perspective, as you know, UNESCO is a global uh, organization, intergovernmental organization. And it is important to, to underline that there are some issues uh, for which international cooperation, especially at the uh, intergovernmental level, can have uh, some added value. Uh, you are talking about the question of peace and conflict prevention. Uh, from our perspective, uh, yeah. organizations like UNESCO have some added value on this specific uh, uh, question instead of, uh, interna uh, of um, national or bilateral uh, uh, um, uh, cooperation. Also for the question of international mobility of artists. This yeah. is something very important because when we are talking about exchanges, uh, we, we have to, to be aware that some artists cannot travel. Yeah. And the barrier on, uh, 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 on, uh, on movement and also the barrier of artistic freedom is yeah. very huge from some artists. Yeah. And we have to keep on mind that on these, on these uh, questions, uh, organizations like uh, uh, UNESCO uh, can do more than at national uh, level. And I'm pleased also to hear about the, the, the question of, um, of youth education on heart. This is question important because uh, youth is the future of all of what we are talking about. And uh, you know also that UNESCO uh, have a program on youth education on heart. And this is something uh, important, but for uh, international cooperation, we, we, we need more involvement uh, from uh, member states uh, uh, through, through the specific uh, funding mechanism to enable us to build uh, more capacity building for uh, member states and also for civil society organizations. And on all these questions, um, uh, from uh, the time being, uh, we are very uh, pleased to count on the uh, uh, special commitment for, uh, from uh, certain uh, member states to allow us to do this uh, important job. Thank, Thank you, you, Monsieur Toussaint. Thank you. I'm sorry we're, we're running way behind schedule, but the, 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 argue, the, the discussion is so interesting and the points that you're making are also very interesting. So it was difficult to stop you. Uh, we have, uh, we don't have any more questions. We couldn't take any more. We just want to say that uh, we greatly appreciate uh, our distinguished guest speakers uh, for sharing this very stimulating and enriching experience and points of view with an audience that is obviously keen uh, to find and support uh, paths to ensure peaceful coexistence in the face of present and very disruptive uh, global trends and challenges. And we certainly are extremely grateful for the generous gift of your time uh, to join us today. Uh, we will now play uh, the video with a closing keynote address by uh, former Director General of UNESCO, Mr. Federico Mayor Zaragoza. And I would like to invite the uh, panelists to step down so we can watch the video, please. Yeah, we'll step down. I will participate with much pleasure in uh, this uh, conference, in this uh, round table, organized so timely, now it's very relevant, the issue, by the government of Andorra, the University of Andorra, and the National Commission for Andorra of UNESCO, because uh, I consider that is the right moment in this seventh art camp, Colors for the Planet, that Andorra organizes. I have been in contact with Janina Mir and uh, Jean Michel Armengol of the National Commission, and uh, also with Miquel Segura of uh, Igualada, that uh, 
is uh, very relevant in his audiovisual capacity to provide us at this very moment, at this very moment, all the visual reasons by which we must now say yes. At this moment, no more, no more force. No more the reason of the force. Now, the force of the reason. Now, we must have the diplomacy of culture. The voice that now we have already, because until three decades, we were unable to express ourselves freely. But now we can express ourselves. Now, we the peoples, that in 1945 Roosevelt established already saying, we the peoples have resolved to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of the war. But at this moment was premature, because the vast majority of the people was being born, living and dying in some square kilometers. But now for the first time in history, now we are not only men, because the absolute power has been always, always in the hands of a little group of men. Now, for the first time, 30 years ago, it started. Now, we can express ourselves. Now, we are men, women, no discrimination because of gender, because of sexual uh, sensibility, because of ideology, because beliefs, because of ethnia. All the human beings equal in dignity. Now, we say that enough is enough, that now we cannot accept anymore, that every day, every day, more than four billion dollars are invested in military expenditures and in armament. More than four billion dollars when thousands of persons die of hunger and extreme poverty. Most of them children from one to five years. No. Now we must say that is uh, the moment to say the sustainable development goals are what will from tomorrow inspire our everyday behavior. Then now, yes, now we are putting into practice the Agenda 2030. This was really, I can assure you, the result of many, many years of uh, saying, please take into account that uh, the climate change, take into account that the uh, emissions of uh, oil and uh, uh, the different uh, carburants that we were using the CO2 production, etc. All this is damaging. Nothing. No reply at all. Already in the 50s, in UNESCO, the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature was established. And the geological international program, and the hydrological geological program, and the Oceanographic Commission, the oceans are the two-thirds of the skin of the earth. And now we must take this into account. The two-thirds of the planet are not earth, are the oceans, is water. And in 1979 already the National Academy of Science of the United States said, be careful because it's not only that the emissions of CO2 are increasing, it's that the reuptake by the oceans, by the plankton, the phytoplankton of the oceans, of this CO2 is also at this moment decreasing because of there are many uh, ships transporting oil that uh, they clean their tanks in the middle of the oceans instead of going to the harbors and to do this in the specialized place. No. It has been always silence. Always when the scientific community 
said, be careful, immediately there were some very big institutions, foundations, as the Exxon Mobile Foundation that said, no, 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 all this is not true. Uh, and they were paying to the pseudo-scientists in order to say the opposite. And uh, when the appeals of UNESCO, of the Club of Rome, of the Academy of Science, were not having any kind of uh, reply, is when we decided, with Maurice Strong, to do, in the year 1992, the summit of the Earth, the first summit of the Earth. And we said, now yes, now everybody will know where we are and what we must do. And we produced the Agenda 21. Silence. No reply at all. There was already Reagan saying that the world must be in the hands of the governance of six countries, of six countries. In reality, the Republican Party of the United States was <laughs> is really doing the role. And he established the G6. And there was not a reply to this first summit of the earth saying, be careful. Now we must change our behavior. And then you know what happened because 10 years later, we had the second summit of the Earth in Johannesburg. Nothing, no reply at all. We published the Earth Charter that is really very important as inspiration from how we must proceed, how we must every day behave. Nothing. And then finally, finally, because of Obama was in the White House, we had in this autumn of the year 2015, the hope at this moment, yes, was a, a pause of hope because we said now, for the first time, yes, United States has agreed on the uh, agreement of the climate in Paris and with the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly to transform the world, it's very beautiful, to transform the world with the Agenda 2013, the Sustainable Development Goals. It's the moment now, it's the moment now to act. But you know what happened. A man called Donald Trump was elected and he immediately said, I will not apply what my predecessor has signed. And no reply and no reaction. Europe, silent. Where are the leadership now? Now the time, the time of the plutocratic neoliberal governance must be finished. Now we know what is happening in Canada. In the north of the United States, more than 49 degrees of temperature. Now, yes. Now we have the evidence. And now we the peoples, we can react. Now we the peoples can express ourselves. Now we the peoples, in part with the uh, digital technology, now we can express and we can behave in a very rapid way in order to, even if there are irreversible processes, to try to redress the present trends. Their friends, I think that is very important that now must be based on this diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, culture of behavior, everyday behavior, ethics, values, human rights. Now, yes, we must have a new governance. This governance must be multilateral. We must, all of us, realize that if we want to face global threats, we must act. Globally, we must act also joint action in order to say, in order to redress, in order to change the expenditures in military and in armament to redress all the present trends with cultural diplomacy. I wish to thank very much all of you and to wish the best results for this meeting.
Okay, we should thank uh, Federico Mayor Sargosa for another very passionate message and for qualifying this roundtable is very timely. And obviously the message was that the world community uh, should ensure that global leaders will not take another 30 years before identifying and reacting to challenges. Okay, finally, the uh, organizers of this roundtable on art for culture diplomacy wish to make a statement calling for continued and increased support and implementation of cultural diplomacy by all sectors of society. The statement comes in the form of the Andorra Declaration for the Promotion of Cultural Diplomacy through higher education institutions and the arts, which will be read, by, read to us by Rector Mikel Nicolau. Rector Nicolau, would you take the floor, please? Autoritats, senyores i senyors, bona tarda. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. For the people following the roundtable online from different time zones, on behalf of the University of Andorra, I want to thank all the participants in this event. And I also want to thank the technicians behind the curtains that are making possible this perfect but complex blended event. Thank you very much. Now it's the time to read the Andorra Declaration for the promotion of cultural diplomacy through higher education, institutions, and the arts. We have received some amendments, uh, some amendment proposals during the last days that we have introduced to the Declaration. These amendments mainly reinforce two fundamental values of universities, academic freedom and university autonomy. So let's go. Preamble. Political, social, environmental, economic, and health issues have all recently converged to threaten a return from a collaborative global culture to a competitive one. In a world becoming once more polarized and mining advances in transformational and lasting peaceful coexistence. Effective strategies must be identified to safeguard the gains in international harmony and to promote common values to offset movements that highlight divisive differences. Therefore, the ARCAM 2021 Perspectives on Arts for Cultural Diplomacy Roundtable participants recognize that the visual arts are a vehicle for the transmission of cultural values and cultural identity that transcend language and cultural barriers. That culture, and more specifically the visual arts, have given proof of a unique resilience and of unparalleled capacity of maintaining inter intercultural dialogue and appreciation of common values in the most challenging of environments. That the visual arts are among the most effective tools of cultural diplomacy, and that cultural diplomacy is an efficient strategy successfully employed by various sectors of society to establish and or to promote national agendas. For market positioning, to improve international relations and to promote cultural understanding among other objectives. That cultural diplomacy plays a crucial role in promoting values of peace, solidarity, tolerance, and coexistence. And considering that ARCAM is a biennial international event of enduring success, launched in 2008 by the Andorra National Commission of UNESCO, that attracts to Andorra international artists to bridge cultural differences, to inspire, to share experience and values, and to showcase this event as an example of international harmony, coexistence, coexistence mutual respect, and collaboration. That within the context of our CAM 2021, artists and experts will also be engaged in assessing ways to maximize the potential and the benefits of cultural diplomacy through the arts, in a roundtable organized in collaboration with the academic community represented by the University of Andorra. We, the Perspectives on Arts for Cultural Diplomacy Roundtable participants, therefore recommend that the successful experience of our CAM be shared internationally as a traveling exhibition, replicated the format in host countries to encourage similar initiative in a concerted effort by local or national governments, our communities, 
UNESCO national commissions, and high education institutions to further the values of peace and understanding through the arts. That, at the initiative of the University of Andorra in ARCAM 2020 and Perspectives on Arts for Cultural Diplomacy Roundtable participating universities, the concept and practice of international mobility and exchanges amongst higher education institutions be widened to regularly include the exchange of our programs. Furthermore, recognizing that the international exchange of know-how, information, and collaboration in academia and research amongst universities is a de facto tool for effective cultural diplomacy, provided academic freedom and university autonomy are fully respected, that a major element in the international academic exchange is the mobility and exchange of students, faculty, researchers, and administrative staff, and considering that the students, faculty, researchers, and administrative staff in international mobility programs benefit from the transfer and exchange of academic know-how and of research and administrative expertise in a generous display of international solidarity and collaboration by the host university and facilitated by the host country, that the experience afforded by said mobility also informally provides a deeper and better understanding of the host country and its people, that this better understanding favors tolerance peaceful coexistence, and overall a culture of peace, convince that reciprocal knowledge established with mobility contribute to promotion of peace, elimination of prejudice, intolerance, and xenophobia, the ARCAM 2021 Perspectives on Arts for Cultural Diplomacy Roundtable participating universities therefore recommend that universities develop and embed in the international mobility programs, the concept and practice of cultural cooperation and dialogue as their way to implement cultural diplomacy through academic exchanges. And equip students, faculty, researchers, and administrative staff to proactively share with their host counterparts or wider local audiences, familiarity and understanding of their country's values, history, and culture that host institutions facilitate the practice of cultural diplomacy through academic exchanges by encouraging and supporting the exercise of set cultural diplomacy, by arranging adequate platforms and providing the widest possible dissemination of related activities among institutional and outside audiences. That host institutions incorporate in the mobility program of visiting students, faculty, researchers, and administrative staff formal exposure to and familiar, familiarization sessions on the values, culture, and history of the host country. That the home institution facilitate and strongly encourage students, faculty, researchers, and administrative staff that have benefited from international exchanges to formally share with their institution's community the knowledge acquired of the values, culture, and history of the host country. In conclusion, the universities underwriting the Andorra Declaration for the Promotion of Cultural Diplomacy through Higher Education Institution and the Arts declare their adherence to the principles of cultural diplomacy in carrying out international mobility, academic and research programs, and make a commitment to ensure that their institutions implement the recommendations enunciated in this declaration. The signatories to this declaration also pledge to promote cultural cooperation exchange and dialogue to further peaceful coexistence, global understanding, and to support the role played by the arts in cultural diplomacy. Andorra, 15 July, 2021. Uh, from now on, uh, the Andorra Declaration uh, is available for signing through uh, the website of the University of Andorra. After the closing of the event, all participants will receive a message with a link to the endorsement forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rector Nicolau. We hope that this declaration will receive the widest uh, support possible. Uh, and now, finally, I would like to invite the Minister of Culture and Sports, uh, Silvia Rica Gonzalez, 
to deliver the closing remarks. Madam Minister, please. Thank you so much. Good evening. Bona tarda a tothom. Un plaer saludar-vos a tots en aquesta trobada. I com a cloenda de la taula rodona a l'entorn de la cultura i la diplomàcia cultural, permeteu-me fer algunes reflexions i consideracions tan generals com específiques de la situació cultural al nostre país. En primer lloc, vull aprofitar per agrair a la Comissió Nacional Andorrana per la UNESCO la creació l'any 2008 de l'ARCAM, un projecte de diplomàcia cultural que té com a objectiu, ho acabem de gaudir tots durant aquesta tarda, fomentar el coneixement, l'intercanvi i difondre els valors de tolerància, respecte i diàleg entre les cultures a través de l'art. En un context globalitzat, l'art i la cultura en general atorga a la diplomàcia un protagonisme i una importància nous en l'agenda internacional dels països. La cultura és un pont de comunicació entre les nacions perquè facilita el coneixement mutu entre els pobles, contribueix al diàleg entre civilitzacions i troba punts de convergència i vinculació però alhora també té un important paper econòmic i de desenvolupament de la societat. Per tant, l'objectiu principal de la cultura en el marc de la diplomàcia cultural és la promoció a l'exterior dels valors de la nostra identitat, ja siguin històrics, culturals o artístics, mitjançant la difusió de les obres d'intel·lectuals i de creadors per assegurar una presència cultural nacional a l'estranger. El Ministeri de Cultura ha publicat recentment el primer llibre blanc de la cultura, que neix del compromís del govern per crear una eina de planificació estratègica de les polítiques culturals del futur d'Andorra. I, per tant, és un pilar estratègic i fonamental que també apareix en el full de ruta de l'any 23 del govern. El llibre fa una diagnosi del sector cultural del país i és la base per a futures decisions polítiques per enfortir el sector, en la introducció es deia, i cito, el canvi de paradigma provocat per la crisi sanitària fa més necessària que mai una cultura que fomenti la transmissió de coneixements, que sigui una peça clau en l'engranatge de la cohesió social del nostre país, perquè la cultura fa créixer els pobles i és un pilar fonamental en el desenvolupament social. Per tant, Cal, més que mai, que les administracions públiques tinguem un paper preeminent en la generació i manteniment d'un ecosistema cultural sòlid. Per tant, un dels grans reptes que apareixen en aquest llibre blanc de la cultura és connectar les polítiques culturals amb la resta de polítiques públiques, socials, econòmiques, educatives, ambientals, turístiques i urbanístiques. El llibre blanc considera que la singularitat del país requereix aliances internacionals i que projectar el país es deve a una estratègia clau en un entorn cada vegada més global que tendeix a moure's i funcionar a través de les xarxes de suport en les quals la cooperació i el sistema de relacions són fonamentals. En un escenari d'internacionalització, la cultura és un element que dona visibilitat al país i la projecció d'Andorra al món s'ha de fonamentar en les seves relacions i en la qualitat d'alguna de les seves produccions o dels seus esdeveniments culturals que s'hi organitzen. Finalment, destaca la capacitat competitiva del sector cultural andorrà en relació amb els dels altres territoris de l'entorn i, per tant, la possibilitat d'intensificar aquest consum cultural transfronterer i atreure activitat econòmica, empreses i professionals vinculats a la cultura com a clau del creixement econòmic. La cultura post-Covid ha ensenyat que és una situació econòmica i la crisi sanitària han afectat de ple el de per si fràgil sector cultural. Aquesta situació ha ensenyat que moltes de les velles fórmules i estratègies emprades fins ara no serveixen per fer front a la nova realitat que s'està imposant. La pandèmia ens mostra que la cultura, a més de tots els valors intrínsecs, té i ha de tenir un paper essencial en la cohesió i el desenvolupament econòmic i social d'un país. I això obligarà tots els agents implicats de la cultura a innovar, a ser imaginatius, agosarats, per cercar noves fórmules de finançament, establir sinergies i mecanismes per implicar més tant la societat com el sector privat. 
optimitzar i compartir recursos amb altres administracions i, com avui és el tema, impulsar aquesta tan evocada diplomàcia cultural. No solament com a una eina d'acció de política exterior, sinó també per ajudar a desenvolupar i consolidar el sector cultural i oferir als nostres artistes i creadors l'oportunitat de treballar i mostrar la seva obra i, d'altra banda, també ha de servir per crear xarxes amb altres institucions o països que afavoreixin l'intercanvi i la col·laboració d'experiències i projectes. Però alhora també cal replantejar com, per aquí, i de quina forma es produeix i es gestiona la cultura, i com, per aquí, i de quina forma es consumeix. Si volem assolir una cultura rica, diversa, de qualitat i sostenible, cal afavorir la professionalització del sector, implicar els artistes i els col·lectius en les polítiques culturals. Fomentar el valor i la importància de la cultura, també com a factor de desenvolupament econòmic. S'ha d'estimular el consum cultural i crear nous públics a través de l'educació, la formació i el coneixement de la diversitat cultural. Finalment, cal potenciar la creació digital amb continguts culturals adaptats i específics per ser difosos a través de les xarxes, per tal d'assolir una cultura universal i accessible a tothom. Per acabar, volia posar de relleu que Andorra, amb un sector cultural en procés d'estructuració i definició, és un país amb una identitat cultural pròpia, reflex de la seva societat plural, sempre acollidor, obert a la diversitat i coneixedor de les diverses realitats i expressions culturals del seu entorn, amb actors, agents i projectes de gran qualitat, que estem segurs que podran ser partícips de projectes de diplomàcia cultural, com el que viurem avui també acollint els artistes que passaran una setmana a Andorra. Desitjo una gran estada a aquests artistes que integren l'edició actual del camp, que puguin gaudir d'Andorra i deixar aquí el seu llegat, que enriquirà aquesta multiculturalitat que fa un moment evocava. Vull agrair novament a l'ambaixadora de bona voluntat d'aquest projecte i la padrina, senyora Ed Basser, pel seu compromís amb la preparació d'aquesta edició i per ser aquí avui a Andorra. Moltes gràcies per la vostra atenció. Dono per conclosa aquesta taula rodona i us desitjo sort, felicitat i un bon final de dia a tothom. Moltes gràcies.